This might be the weirdest place on Earth. Barren, frigid wasteland so dry that it's scattered with the mummified bodies of animals unfortunate enough to end up there. A place where blood cascades out of ice cliffs, turning the black rocks and frozen lakes a ferrous red. This is a mountainous polar desert without ice, traversed only by the howling winds that scour its valleys. A place so unearth-like that we probably shouldn't tell Elon about it. These are the McMurdo Dry Valleys, located in the Ross Sector of West Antarctica. They're a unique and strange environment, so Mars-like that NASA uses them as a test ground for their Martian explorations, and a place I've always been intrigued by. So I spoke to a scientist who knows them better than anyone. I'm Marta, I'm a polar meteorologist, and I'm specialised in the McMurdo Dry Valleys. Marta did her PhD on the Dry Valleys, so who better to ask? Why are the McMurdo Dry Valleys so friggin' weird? Yeah, the McMurdo Dry Valleys are so weird, because it's really not what you expect of Antarctica. You expect big, white, white landscapes is full of snow and ice. And actually there's mountains, there's rocks, a lot of bare ground, uh, there's lakes, uh, all kind of unexpected things. It's almost more like a Mars or a moon landscape than a place on Earth. It's also really strange. You have rocks with holes that are shaped by the wind. You have mummified seals. There's lakes that are covered in crazy forms of ice, there's glaciers with horizontal cliffs of 30 meters high and it's therefore it's really a place like no other. One of the weirdest things you can see in these valleys are blood falls, which are waterfalls partly frozen, completely red. And while it's probably because of iron particles that come from the soil, scientists are still trying to figure out why we see this here. What the hell? Imagine being in a place that is so windy that the wind blows literal holes through solid rock and where the glaciers look like they've just been dumped there by a giant. But seriously, this is a really unique environment with some spectacular features that differentiate it from the rest of Antarctica. It's one of the few places in continental Antarctica with permafrost, frozen carbon rich soil that we more commonly find in the Arctic. Most other locations in the Antarctic are solid ice. Another feature that sets the dry valleys apart are their dryness. Clues in the name, I guess. Antarctica is a desert on average receiving just a seventh of New York's yearly precipitation or a quarter of London's. Yep, you heard right. NYC is wetter than London. Who knew? But the dry valleys are another level, which is part of what makes them so bizarre. The McMurdo dry valleys are so bare, partly because there's no inflow from ice from the big Antarctic ice sheet, because there's just mountains that block this ice flow, but also the snowfall rates are really, really low. Unlike the rest of Antarctica, the dry valleys are almost totally devoid of snow. They receive only around 10 centimetres, or four inches, of snow per year. That's less than 1% of NYC's annual precip, if you're wondering. Part of the reason for that is the relentless winds, which whip through the mountains, causing any snow to blow away or turn instantly into water vapour. And those winds aren't just any winds, either. Remember this guy? Yeah, well keep remembering them. The dry valleys, as the name suggests, are surrounded by mountains, which sets up a pretty unique wind regime. On the one hand, we have catabatic winds, which are super cold winds that rush downhill from the Antarctic plateau further inland. Because cold air is denser than warm air, these incredibly chilly winds sweep through the valleys at hurricane speeds on their way to the coast, evaporating moisture before ice can form. Fern winds, on the other hand, are warm, dry gusts caused by air descending over mountain ranges, heating up as it compresses. Within the mountainous terrains of these valleys, strong fern winds occur, which bring really warm and dry conditions. And actually, in summer, these fern winds are really important in bringing glaciers to melt. The catabatics keep things cold, while the fern winds can even drive melt in the right conditions, which means that the dry valleys experience some pretty extreme variation in conditions. So given that the conditions seem pretty hostile, even by Antarctic standards, is there any life? Is there anybody out there?
So you might think, does anything live in the dry valleys? If you think of animals in Antarctica, you might think about penguins or seals. But if you find them in the dry valleys, they're often dead. And they might look like something like this, that they almost mummified or preserved really well in the cold and dry environments. But any seal that comes into these valleys, they will die there. So the life that actually thrives here is much, much smaller. It's microorganisms that live in small streams that only flow in summer. Some mosses on the beds of these streams or next to the lakes. Um, so it's minimal life that can live in this uh, harsh environment. So, turns out, yes. But as Marta says, most of the life in these extreme environments is pretty small. The environment is hardcore, with no year-round water sources and virtually nothing to eat. And yet, you can find life in these conditions. In fact, these microbes are so hardcore that scientists have used them to help understand what life on Mars or elsewhere in space might look like. These tiny organisms are the very definition of extremophiles, living in bonkers places. Some live in streams that only flow for a few weeks a year and lay frozen and dormant during the long winter, while others inhabit liquid pockets deep in frozen lakes and take their nutrients from dirt in the ice. There are even bacteria living oxygen-free of sulfur and iron that survive at sub-zero temperatures underneath glaciers. And as for the big guys, scientists think that penguins and seals waddle inland along the seasonal rivers that are fed by melting glaciers in summer. The animals think there's food inland and follow the streams. Then when the short melt season is over, they're stranded and soon succumb to the harsh environment. The air is so dry that their bodies don't decompose and they become mummies. Spooky. But Marta is a meteorologist and she wasn't there to study microbes or mummies. Yeah, it was really special to, to, as a scientist to be able to visit this region. It's a place on Earth that's really like no other. Uh, and to be able to walk around there and experience this, this really special and uh, rough landscape. Uh, yeah, it, I think it will always uh, stay with me. So I was there to study the glaciers because they are the main source of water in this very dry environment. So understanding when and how these glaciers melt will help us understand how the whole ecosystem might respond. And my specific interest is about the link between the atmosphere and the glaciers. So what are the weather conditions that actually generate melt? One of the defining features of the dry valleys is the seasonal rivers that flow during the summer, fed by meltwater from the valley's glaciers. One of the more famous ones was christened the Onyx River by researchers visiting in the 1950s. These are the same rivers and streams that shocked some of the earliest polar explorers at the turn of the 20th century, being the first liquid water they'd seen on the continent. What we found is that these fan winds are really important in bringing positive air temperatures, and suddenly the glaciers will start melt a lot and the rivers start flowing. These rivers are therefore hyper-dependent on the weather conditions, because they need a source of heat to bring temperatures above zero and kickstart the melt that feeds them, which means in terms that the entire crazy ecosystem is dependent on melting. It's a really cool example of how connected everything is. Because to like really understand the weird and wonderful ecosystem of the dry valleys, you also have to understand the glaciers that control the rivers, the winds that control when the glaciers melt, and the geography of the mountains that produce the winds in the first place. And it's why being able to measure the weather accurately is so useful for understanding this weird place. So the main thing we did in the field is maintaining weather stations because they really give us valuable data in understanding the atmosphere and especially the weather stations on glaciers help us understand all the energy components of the atmosphere that lead to melt of the glacier surface. It's also important we go there to maintain the weather stations that are already there, so we have long-term records of the weather in these valleys. Weather stations are an important way of understanding how the atmosphere impacts the dry valleys. Without them, scientists can't untangle the precise causes and processes that lead to melting and therefore the water resources for this unique ecosystem. So in these valleys, usually the air temperature in summer is just below zero and you just need or a lot of sunshine for generation of melt or this fan winds, so those really warm winds that bring suddenly the air temperatures up and a lot of melt occurs. If the temperatures might rise with climate change we expect that there will be a lot more melt in this uh, region because in summer the air temperatures are so close to zero that a little change in this average temperature might have a big impact on the melt that is generated. 
Ah yes, that old climate change thing. While other parts of Antarctica will respond slowly to climate change, the lack of snow and ice in the dry valleys means they will respond much more quickly. Snow and ice keeps the local climate relatively cool, so the lack of it in the dry valleys means they can heat up fast with enough sunlight. Besides, ice melts and changes very slowly, meaning the rest of Antarctica is buffered from rapid changes, while the dry valleys respond much more quickly to rising temperatures. Currently, the main driver of increased melting in the dry valleys is thought to be a decline in cloud cover, which allows more sunlight to reach the surface and heat it. But temperature rise as part of a wider warming trend could start to play more of a role in the near future. That's why we're also worried about the glaciers in this region, because you can imagine if the air temperature would rise by a little bit, suddenly there would be a lot more melt. And this can completely change the character of the dry valleys. It's not just temperature that could change. Climate shifts could also alter the same characteristics that make the dry valleys so special. So in the future, the dry valleys might get warmer, but also wetter. The dry valleys are actually located really close to the coast, where now there's a lot of sea ice. And if the sea ice would be gone, there's a lot more open water where water can evaporate. So we're trying to understand how such changes might actually change evaporation and snowfall of the dry valleys. Maybe it will not be so dry anymore in the future. More snow and possibly even some rain could make some of the creatures in the dry valleys thrive. But it would also totally shift the balance of the ecosystem there and change the whole vibe. And as temperatures rise, so too does the number of extreme events impacting Antarctica. Heat waves, extreme precipitation, crashing sea ice and other events are becoming more and more frequent and intense at the southern end of the Earth. And that will inevitably affect the McMurdo Dry Valleys too. Extreme heat that raises temperatures temporarily above the melting point in the winter especially could threaten the existence even of these hardy microbes by prematurely bringing them out of their winter deep freeze dormancy. As those happen more often, some creatures will cope with change better than others, shifting the ecosystem and changing the way it works. Whatever happens, this weird landscape is gonna stay pretty weird, but Antarctica Antarctica as a whole is changing and so are the dry valleys. Whether they'll stay dry or not, well, we'll have to wait and see. If you want to catch the full interview with Marta, you can head over to my Patreon page and watch it there for free. You can also support the channel by signing up as a patron there or by clicking the join button underneath this video. Oh, and she'll hate me for saying this, but Marta makes these amazing prints and artworks that are inspired by her research and her trips to Antarctica and the dry valleys. Um, so I'm going to link her website and socials in the description just in case you want to check them out. They're really cool. Anyway, watch this next if you want to find out more about how extremes are reshaping Antarctica and I'll catch you in the next one.